real issues of violence in our country. So I would like to start off with uh, my fellow colleague from the great state of Missouri. Uh, we have Blaine Lukenmeyer. So, gentlemen, uh, what would you like to share about our Second Amendment rights? Thank you, uh, Congressman Hartzler. It's always uh, good to uh, work with another fellow uh, uh, from Missouri, uh, the Show Me State, where we can uh, give some folks a little insight as to what's going on. Um, Mr. Speaker, when I was growing up in rural Missouri, firearms were a regular part of my life. Beyond learning how to safely handle firearms while hunting and shooting, I learned also to respect them. Like so many parents, I made sure those same lessons were instilled in my own children. It is because of the efforts of parents or adults who can have a positive influence on a child that the culture of safety and respect toward firearms has been so well maintained in rural America. Our communities and families work very hard to ensure this heritage and it is something, and it is very upsetting when lawmakers, many of whom know nothing about firearms, attempt to place limitations on our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. The Second Amendment is, in fact, a primary constitutional right that sets America far apart from nations around the world. Our founders got this right. They knew ensuring the right of a citizen to keep and bear arms would always be vital to ensuring personal freedoms. <clears throat> I spent my time as elected official first in the Missouri State House of Representatives and now in Congress working to protect the Second Amendment. However, not only is it important to protect the right to own the gun, it is also important to protect the privacy of the information that you have the information about the ownership of the gun and the concealed carry permits and things like that. I'll give you an example. In my state just recently, uh, in fact, we're barely finished working on this, uh, it's come to, revel to, 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 uh, to our attention that the Department of Revenue and High Patrol, in working in conjunction with the Social Security Administration's Inspector General, were looking into uh, getting control of the concealed carry permit list of all the folks in the state of Missouri to compare it for uh, mental health disability fraud in our state. And while we were satisfied in going through all the different uh, informational checks and cross checks with uh, regard to the, the federal side of this, that they did everything legally they were supposed to do as well as the information was protected uh, and not compromised, it still pointed out some of the loose and sloppiness uh, that, went, uh, that went on with regards to uh, the way that the state folks handle our information. And to me that is something that we have to be constantly watchful for. And so, you know, someone once said that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And I think with regard to Second Amendment rights, it's certainly something that is very true. With that, I yield back to Bell on time. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I, I think well said there. Our rural heritage is um, based on our Second Amendment rights and uh, well said. And certainly, being from Missouri, I appreciate your work and we've worked together on this. This is a very real concern with, I call it, the Department of Revenue debacle. And uh, certainly appreciate uh, State Senator Kurt Schaefer and others there in Missouri who've been on the forefront of getting to the bottom of this and how our concealed carry list was released to federal authorities uh, without all of uh, the permissions and all of the safeguards in place. And that is very, very disturbing. So thank you for your work on that and uh, for your comments. Uh, I would now like to yield to a new member uh, here who has just hit the ground running and we're, brings so much uh, to our whole delegation to his service. Appreciate uh, Chris Collins from New York and uh, I'd be happy to yield time to you, gentlemen. Thank you. I want to thank both the gentlewoman and gentlemen from Missouri for their comments. And Mr. Speaker, I come to the House floor this afternoon to stand in support of the Second Amendment. I also proudly stand here in support of all the law-abiding gun owners in New York's 27th Congressional District and all across our country. As a father and a grandfather, the recent violent tragedies in our country have left my heart heavy. But as a gun owner with a carry permit, I proudly carry my dad's Ithaca 45 from World War II. And as a member of Congress representing thousands of law-abiding gun owners, I join my colleagues today in saying we refuse to allow these tragedies to be used for political gain. These recent crimes should not be used as a pretense to weaken our constitutional rights, and law-abiding citizens should not fall victim to additional laws and regulations which have no impact on reducing crime. Let us not kid ourselves. What was recently proposed in the Senate 
and what has recently become law in my home state of New York would have done nothing to prevent the new town or the Christmas time shootings of firefighters in Webster, a community just outside my district. I strongly support the Second Amendment and the right of an individual to protect themselves and their family. The actions of depraved killers should not punish law-abiding gun owners. And the actions of this Congress should not pick away at the rights guaranteed by our Constitution. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It's well said. Tragedies should not be used for political gain. That is, that is so true. We want to get at the heart of what caused violence and how to protect children and uh, not just pass laws that wouldn't even address the problem. You know, I, I'm glad to see my colleague from South Dakota here. Uh, she is uh, quite a champion of uh, gun rights, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing your comments, lady. Uh, about the Second Amendment. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I thank the gentlelady from Missouri for her leadership on this issue. You know, uh, people sacrificed and uh, for the rights that we have. And the Constitution is so important to me. It's important to the people in South Dakota and to my family. And the Second Amendment is uh, very dear to our heritage. And that's why I wanted to come to the floor today, because I wanted to talk about how the Constitution guarantees us the individual's right to keep and bear arms. And that's why I strongly support the Second Amendment. This right isn't abstract to me. It's part of my family's heritage, and it's my state's culture. I'm a gun owner, a member of the Congressional Sportsmen's Caucus. I'll continue to fight and defend this right for the people of South Dakota and for our way of life. You know, the Second Amendment has been described in many different ways over the years. But some of those uh, are such as it is there to support our natural rights of self-defense. It's there for resistance of oppression. It even was described as a civic duty to act in concert to defense in the defense of the state. These are all reasons that we need to make sure that we're continuously talking about the benefits of this right. What it means to mothers and fathers who are protecting their families and what it means to us uh, growing up in a country where people sacrificed, bled, and died to protect the rights that we have. You know, growing up in South Dakota, I've always had an enormous amount of respect and appreciation for the outdoors and for hunting. If you aren't familiar with South Dakota, you know, uh, I'll tell you that uh, hunting is a very important part of it. It's one of our greatest traditions and way of life across the state. You know, I grew up uh, hunting and taking hunting trips uh, sometimes for weeks on end, one or two week trips to the mountains to hunt with my dad and my brothers. Uh, it was good family quality time. Uh, we had a lot of conversations while we were enjoying the outdoors. Uh, the first person that taught me how to hunt and to carry a gun correctly was my grandmother. Uh, me and her and her black lab BJ would go out and spend hours together. It wasn't during those times that she not only taught me the proper way to handle a firearm and to enjoy the wildlife, but also life lessons that I don't think I would have gotten if I hadn't spent that much time with her in the outdoors enjoying that heritage. Uh, this belief in uh, the Second Amendment is critically important to South Dakotans, and uh, I certainly appreciate the fact that I had the opportunity to enjoy it. Now I have the chance with my own kids. Uh, and with my husband, Brian, you know, when the opening day of pheasant season is always big in South Dakota. It's a family reunion, but obviously there's many, many friends that show up for that as well. It starts with a big breakfast. Uh, we all gather together for good in entertainment and conversation until it's time to go out and start enjoying the day together. Uh, it's a tradition that we don't want to lose. And every year, sportsmen and women flock to South Dakota to enjoy this tradition and take advantage of our state's abundance of hunting and wildlife. I want to give you a few facts about South South Dakota. Uh, with over 700,000 acres of public hunting land, South Dakota is home to the nation's best pheasant hunting, and it's the pheasant hunting capital of the world. In fact, last year, pheasant hunters were able to put 1.55 million roosters in their game bags. In 2011 alone, the pheasant hunting season had an economic impact of over $225 million to our state. It's our number two industry is tourism, which a big part of that happens during the hunting season. A majority of the money spent from that $225 million comes in from out-of-state visitors. Hunting and maintaining a healthy habitat for wildlife is one of the great things that I appreciate about South Dakota. It's why I'm so proud to call it home. You know, during the debates that have occurred here in Washington, D.C. recently, I received many, many thousands, actually, letters from South Dakotans. I just want to read a couple of excerpts from a couple of those if I have the chance. Uh, the first one was from Kevin in Aberdeen, and he said, I urge you to oppose any and all anti-gun legislation that will simply penalize law-abiding gun owners. Instead, focus on improvements to our nation's mental health system 
and enhancing school security while respecting our Second Amendment rights. Mike, who was also from Aberdeen, said this is clearly the wrong answer for a real issue, talking about a bill that had been proposed. Taking away a right that has been proven to save lives time and again is the wrong answer against obvious mental issues and security lapses. The last one I want to touch on is from Greg. Uh, he says, I agree that work needs to be done to keep weapons out of the hands of mentally ill individuals, but this isn't the answer. I regularly use a rifle that would be banned under some proposed legislation when controlling coyotes and the rabbit populations on my farm. I've also used the rifle for controlling prairie dog populations and other landowner property, in addition to hunting on public lands. You know, that's one of the things we don't talk about a lot. For many people in the middle of the country, out in western South Dakota, they simply wouldn't be able to be in business anymore if they didn't have the opportunity to control predators that could wipe out their entire livestock herd. And the Second Amendment guarantees them the right to have the ability to do that. This is just a small glimpse into the traditions that we have in South Dakota, the heritage that gun ownership offers all of us. And I want to thank the gentlelady for giving me the opportunity to talk about that. Uh, the Second Amendment is critically important. It needs to be defended, and I was very proud to stand here and do that with you today. With that, I yield back. Well, thank you, lady. It was sure um, important, I think, that those voices from South Dakota would be heard and how it is a part of a heritage of so many people in this country and how it has very practical and real benefits to the citizens. And uh, we need to focus on solutions that are based on facts and not emotions. And so thank you. You know, one thing that the lady talked about is that it is a, a constitutional right. And I wanted to just uh, reiterate that the U.S. Supreme Court has affirmed that gun ownership is an individual right. In District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the D.C.'s complete gun ban infringes on the Second Amendment rights of the D.C. citizens, and it clarified that the Second Amendment guarantees a fundamental individual right to have a firearm in the home. And so this isn't something just uh, that was talked about and established years ago when our country was founded. It has been upheld recently, and we're very thankful for that and want to continue to protect that right. Uh, we have a gentleman here from Texas who uh, I'm sure knows all about rights and wants to share a little bit about Texas views on why it's important to have our Second Amendment rights. So this is Blake Fahrenthold, and uh, I yield to you. Thank you very much. And as I was uh, listening to the uh, gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Nome, her stories about growing up uh, around firearms and the quality time that she spent with her grandmother learning marksmanship and learning gun safety and learning about life in the outdoors really struck home with me. I remember uh, growing up with uh, my grandfather, uh, driving around the ranch, learning to shoot a 22, and uh, moving up and uh, learning how to uh, shoot a shotgun, learning how to do so safely. And, you know, in Texas, gu gun control is hitting what you aim at, and that's part of growing up uh, with the understanding of firearm safety and, and marksmanship and it's a part of many Americans lives just like it was a part of my life and I, I do I got a lot of letters as the, the debate uh, about gun control was going through the Senate as well urging me uh, to continue to stand up for the Second Amendment rights that uh, our founding fathers realized was uh, so important the right to bear arms of the right that those in the Revolutionary War fought for and and uh, one of the letters came uh, just this week from a student in a Boy Scout named Caleb. And he said, uh, Dear Representative uh, Farenthold, I wanted to thank you for your beliefs on gun control in our state. I believe that we all have a right to bear arms and protect ourselves if we are in harm. And that really kind of sums up uh, the, the feeling of a lot of folks uh, in Texas and a lot of uh, the farmers and ranchers that... Uh, that I represent. You know, as Representative Nome was talking about spending time uh, shooting with her children, one of my things that I look back on in raising my daughters, they're now in college, and you look back and think, well, what should I have done? I should have spent more time outside with them. I should have spent uh, more time passing on some of the things that I learned. Uh, but there's still an opportunity. Morgan, uh, my 24-year-old daughter, came to me uh, just a couple of weekends ago when I was back home in Corpus Christi and said, Dad, can we take a concealed carry uh, class together this summer? So that's on the agenda for uh, 
uh, August when I'm back in Texas is passing on the tradition of the safe and responsible use of uh, firearms uh, in my family. And I'm looking forward to spending time with her in that concealed carry class, and I hope it instills in her the same uh, passion that I have for the, the sport of shooting. Uh, if, if this plays out well, we're going to spend some time on the skeet range. Uh, we're going to spend some time out uh, uh, hunting, and it, it's something that I'm really looking forward to. It's an important part of America. It's an important part of folks' family lives. Second Amendment's got to be protected, and the traditions of safe firearms use in this country needs to continue for a myriad of reasons, just more reasons than I can uh, list. But I see you've got quite a few other people here who want to uh, talk about their experiences with the Second Amendment and their beliefs, so I'm not going to eat up all the time and I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blake. Uh, I, I know I'll look forward to hearing how it goes in August with your daughter right. there. And I think you made a really great point about the important role of protection and how firearms provide a very practical and very, very vital uh, a role in self-protection. You know, estimates range that uh, from anywhere at 83,000 times a year up to perhaps a million times a year, citizens of this country use firearms in order to protect themselves. Uh, in Missouri, let me tell, share you, with you just a couple of examples. Uh, in 2008, there was a woman in Cape Girardeau who endured a horrific crime. Uh, someone broke into her uh, apartment through a window, and, and she was raped. Two days later, she came home, and that person was there again. She had had the window repaired, but they were there. This time, though, she was prepared. She had borrowed a friend's shotgun. And she protected herself this time with the shotgun, and the outcome was totally different. And the person is in jail now. And uh, there's another example in Kansas City. Um, there was a man who had a restraining order against someone who was trying to do him harm. He entered his home, and once again, he was attacked by this person with a knife. But thanks to having a gun in the home, he was able to stop him, and that person is behind bars as well. And we could go on with many, many examples, but Americans every day use their Second Amendment rights to protect and defend their families and themselves, and this is so important that we keep that ability to do that. And that's why our found, founding fathers established this right. And now I'd like to turn to my friend from Michigan, uh, Tim Wahlberg, uh, to share your thoughts on the Second Amendment. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Well, I thank, thank the gentlelady, my friend from Missouri, for uh, holding this opportunity for us to speak on the Second Amendment. And I've often said at town hall meetings that we're talking about the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the Second Amendment uh, in the Bill of Rights uh, that uh, namely speaks to the issue that was declared so uh, strongly in the Declaration of Independence, that document, one of two documents that could be considered the greatest man-made documents ever penned, the Declaration of Independence and then the Constitution. Uh, the Bill of Rights understood what the Declaration said that all men are created equal and endowed with certain unalienable rights, namely the right to life, mm -hmm. liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think the framers and founders understood with the First, first Amendment the right to free speech and, and the freedom of religion, but also that understanding that the right to life involved making sure that I could defend myself, protect myself, care for myself, mm -hmm. feed, for, feed myself with the use of a weapon in the field in hunting, but, but not simply that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would say it was there to make sure that a, a citizen, a free citizen of the United States was able to care for himself or herself, his family or her family in any shape or form. And so I see the, the First Amendment as important, but I see equally important that a Second Amendment the right to keep and bear arms. And as my friend Ted Nugent says, keep is defined as it's mine, it's not yours, you're not going to take it from me. Very simple. Very simple. And I think we need to understand as there are laws that are being thought of, well-intentioned even, and yet laws that really aren't based in reality, of what takes, a place, takes place around civilization, 
when it understands that we need to make sure that we don't step on other people's rights and their freedoms and their opportunities, yet there is a place when we must be prepared to defend ourselves so that those right, rights can be carried on, not only for ourselves but for those that count on us to care. Benjamin Franklin, in a famous quote, said it this way. He says, They that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither safety nor liberty. Well said. Mm -hmm. And I think there are people with well-meaning intentions right now that aren't thinking of the fact that liberty comes with a cost. And it comes with a responsibility and accountability to continue on to make sure that that liberty continues, not only for me, but for you and everyone else. And that liberty is protected from those who would take away our freedoms, our rights, even our lives. And while I like to hunt, and I love to trap shoot, and I love to shoot skeet, and I love to shoot sporting clay, and I love to target practice, and in my, my farm we have a target range. And my wife uses it as well. In fact, she uses it better uh, than I do with, with a pistol. Yet we also understand that with the fun and enjoyment that can come from being trained, understanding the, the concerns that are there uh, as any tool, as my dad taught me not only how to shoot a gun, and the dangers, inherent dangers that were there that, that also demanded my responsibility and accountability. He also taught me how to use a, a, a radial saw and mm -hmm. said it would work very well in doing the things it was meant for, but you have to be careful with it. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we who believe in the Second Amendment believe that there ought to be training and people ought to care for how they use their weapons, but we believe they ought to be freely allowed for us to use as they were intended for all good purposes. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, Leroy Brown and his junkyard dog were my neighbors. I love that area of Calumet City where I grew up, but I also know that there are dangers. And I also know that protection is required, and the protection to fit the need and the concern is what must be there. So I would say to my friend and colleague as well as the speaker and to those that might listen to these words uh, that the Second Amendment is not the problem. And the law-abiding citizen who carries out the responsibilities of the Second Amendment is not the problem. And most of us fit in that category. And nothing that the, the, the bill that was put forth in the Senate or any other thoughts would take care of those criminals. It would not have changed the, the Boston bombers in their ability to get and to use for criminal terrorist purposes any change or impingement on the Second Amendment. They would have still done their atrocities. They would have still got their weapons. And the only, law, only impact negative would have been on law-abiding citizens, the ability to keep, to bear arms, to prevent, protect themselves, and to carry out the constitutional right. So I thank the gentlelady from Missouri for allowing us to speak on this issue. Hopefully that some would hear the common sense of it all and not just hear what some would say that if we appreciate weapons, we are warmongers or we are uh, living in danger and producing danger in other people's lives. But the fact is just the opposite. We are there to assure safety, assure liberty, and to make sure that people are protected against criminals who would abuse us regardless of what the law or the Constitution says. I will defend that and I thank my colleagues for standing uh, for this reality and truth of the Second Amendment. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. I, well said. Um, you know, I, I like how you point out that the right to life is tied to the Second Amendment, to be able to defend ourselves and protect that life. That is so, so true. And that safety, uh, it's not a safety issue. In fact, uh, violent crime has dropped by 72% since 1993 in this country. But actually, um, there's been an increase, a 47% increase in U.S. households that, uh, that have guns. We now have... 47% uh, of us that own a gun and it's, we have this, you know, crime has gone down. So, excellent point there. Uh, I'd like to yield to my friend from Louisiana, uh, Representative Steve Scalise, and uh, he's a champion of our Second Amendments. And uh, thank you for coming, and I yield to you. Uh, well, thank you. I want to thank my colleague, Ms. Hartzler from Missouri, for, for hosting this leadership hour to talk about our Second Amendment rights. 
and for yielding time as well. I'm very proud to rise in strong support of our Second Amendment rights uh, and also in opposition uh, to many of these bills that have been floating around Congress to take away those rights that are so precious to all Americans, uh, those rights that were so important uh, that the Second Amendment to the Constitution, part of our Bill of Rights, the first set of amendments to our Constitution, uh, enshrined this right to the American people uh, to bear arms. This wasn't a right that they just gave to the militia, to the military, uh, to our local law enforcement. This was a right that was granted to all Americans because it was so precious and important. And when you look at some of the bills that are, that are floating around here uh, these last few weeks, and you know, we were all shocked and saddened uh, by the murders at Sandy Hook, uh, but I think what's also disappointing uh, is when you have these tragedies, uh, unfortunately there are people, uh, Washington politicians, that try to take advantage of those tragedies uh, to then come behind and try to impose their own agenda in the name of somebody else. Uh, and, and when you look at a lot of these bills that have been filed, uh, they had absolutely nothing to do uh, with those murders or, or any of these other tragedies that we've seen. Uh, you know, you look at Sandy Hook, he stole the, gun, uh, the guns from his mother. He murdered his own mother. I think they counted over 40 different laws that were broken by the Sandy Hook murderer. 40 different laws. And then somebody's going to tell you that one more law that makes it harder for law-abiding citizens to get a gun would have then stopped him from doing that when in fact he didn't even break the laws that they're proposing. Uh, and so I think people see through that. Through that. People realize uh, that these bills are unfortunately the same bad ideas that have been floating around for decades by people who just want to take away our Second Amendment rights. Uh, they just don't share those same beliefs that our founding fathers had uh, when they felt that it was so important that all American citizens have these protections. Uh, I'm proud to come from Louisiana. We call ourselves the sportsman's paradise. And you know, you know, when you talk about the Second Amendment, we're not just talking about hunting. Some people want to say, you know, the Second Amendment really is just about hunting. It's not about hunting. It's, it's about a lot more than hunting. It's about the ability for people to protect themselves. Uh, you know, I, I was in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. You know, during those days, there were some very dark days. Uh, we had a few weeks, not just hours or days, we had a few weeks where you couldn't pick up the phone and call 911. There was no 911 system. In many cases, there was no power for weeks. Uh, you couldn't get law enforcement to come if there was uh, somebody trying to come and loot your house or, or worse. And so the citizen at home in their house with their gun was the only protection that people had for not just days, but for weeks after Hurricane Katrina. You know, one of the more frightening things that happened after Katrina, and there were many frightening things that happened during Katrina, uh, but after Katrina, local law enforcement gave an order to have the police actually go door to door in the city of New Orleans and confiscate guns from law-abiding citizens. It actually happened. It's been well documented. Uh, to the point where when I was in the state legislature at the time, I filed legislation to prevent that from ever being able to happen again. And in fact, the NRA, who's so, who's so uh, uh, decried by all of these gun control advocates, the NRA actually stood up and said it's wrong for government to try to go door to door and take your guns from you. And people said, oh, well, that could never happen in America. And yet it happened. It happened in an American city, in New Orleans. After Katrina, there's actual video footage of a woman, Miss Connie, she was in her house in uptown New Orleans, and the, the police actually came to her house to take her gun, and she didn't want to give up her gun. And they tackled her. They broke her collarbone. I actually brought her to testify for my bill. I'm proud to say my, my bill passed back then. And no longer can anybody in Louisiana take away your guns, even during a natural disaster. And fortunately, because of the NRA's leadership, uh, they made this a national law. It's now a national law. But that actually happened. And so this Second Amendment right is incredibly sacred, and it's, it's unfortunate that some try to take advantage of disasters to go and try to chip those rights away. Uh, but that's why we're here today. Uh, that's why I'm proud of my colleague from Missouri and so many others uh, who are here to stand up for that, that right that we all hold dear. And I'm happy to yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, it was very helpful, I think, to be reminded of that firsthand account 
of what can happen and what did happen in Louisiana when the government came to take the guns away from the citizens there. And we don't ever want to see that happen again because, like you said, it's imperative for personal protection besides being a personal right. So thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Um, well, we have uh, my friend and colleague from Indiana who's come to join us here, Marlon Stutzman. And um, you brought a, a couple of guests here with you today to, to be a part of our special order? I did. Very good. Well, I yield to you. I want to hear what you have to share. I thank the lady uh, from Missouri for yielding. I brought my two sons, uh, Peyton and Preston, along today. So it's, uh, it's <laughs> father and son outing here. And, um, great. That's great. Uh, Peyton asked if he could come along to... Uh, hear us talk about the Second Amendment and uh, we um, of course were uh, farmers back in Indiana and I grew up with a uh, BB gun and Peyton now has his little BB gun and a, a, a 410 22 and Preston has a little BB gun so we enjoy the uh, sport uh, out on the farm mm -hmm. but I want to just thank you for uh, for bringing this issue to the floor today because it's such an important issue for um, for our country and, and obviously a, a lot of things have happened over the past uh, several years that uh, brings this issue to us uh, appropriately. And I believe that we do need to have a discussion not only about our Second Amendment rights but about gun safety and, um, and how uh, each of us is, uh, as Americans is responsible um, that, uh, that anyone who owns a gun and, um, you know, of course, uh, my wife, Christy, and I are, are grieving, uh, along with our, our family, is grieving for those who lost loved ones in, um, in Newtown and, of course, uh, in Arizona and Colorado and Virginia and, and so many other places. We've uh, uh, had some um, of cases in Fort Wayne uh, of just irresponsibility but also intended uh, murder. Uh, but, of course, as we saw what happened in uh, Boston, um, bad people can take uh, any device and, and hurt people uh, with uh, those devices and it is always sad to see. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I know uh, from, from constituents uh, back home is that they don't expect uh, knee-jerk reactions uh, from Washington and, and when it comes to legislation. And um, I would like to just quote a couple of uh, quotes from our founding fathers uh, that I think are so important in quotes ab about our Second Amendment rights. Uh, George Washington said, a free people ought to be armed. Uh, Thomas Jefferson says that uh, the strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is as a last resort to protect themselves against tyranny in government. He also says uh, the beauty of the Second Amendment is that it will not be needed until they try to take it. And I think that that is why this is such, um, it, it motivates people to, uh, to, to contact their um, members of Congress to let them know how they feel. And I, as you watch the events unfold, um, Madam Speaker, is, is that in the Senate, um, we are a democracy um, that is represented by people that we send to Washington. And as we saw the votes unfold, I think that um, each one of those members in the Senate um, was representing the people that they, uh, that they were elected by. And, um, and of course, the president was very critical of uh, the Senate uh, after they uh, were not able to pass a bill that he had wanted. And, um, but, you know, when he's criticizing them, he's criticizing each one of uh, those particular members, but also the people that sent them uh, to the United States Senate. And uh, to, to watch each different vote take place, I think, tells us a lot that, uh, that Americans across the country um, are not about just knee-jerk reactions, but about responsibility when it comes to gun ownership. It uh, also uh, shows their, their um, passion about protecting the Second Amendment. And many of these members in the Senate did not want to uh, vote for um, tighter gun control laws uh, because they were representing the people uh, from, from their particular states. And so I, I believe that um, last week, you know, the American people spoke. It wasn't just the Senate. It was the American people, through their representatives, spoke that they don't want stricter uh, gun, gun legislation. Uh, this country, uh, we've already tried uh, Senator Feinstein's so-called assault weapons ban in the 90s, 
and it failed to reduce murder rates then, and it would, uh, I believe, fail to redu reduce murder rates now. Um, the American people understand that, and, um, and I believe that the, the United States Senate uh, understands that as well. They've, they've seen this uh, before. And so while we see, um, the, while we saw the Senate uh, work through, while we watched them work through the gun legislation, there was one particular amendment that I thought was very um, intriguing, and that was the amendment that Senator Cornyn uh, from Texas uh, offered, and that was um, an amendment that I have a bill uh, filed here in the House, H.R. 578, it's uh, called the Respecting States' Rights and Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act of 2013, and which basically allows uh, law-abiding citizens, those who have uh, a concealed weapon permit, to carry across state lines to those states that do have concealed carry permits. And uh, Senator Cornyn offered a very similar amendment to uh, the bill that uh, the underlying bill in the Senate. And uh, it, it almost uh, passed. It was within three votes of passing, which uh, I thought was very interesting that while the president was trying to uh, enact stricter gun <laughs> legislation, mm -hmm. uh, a, a bill that would actually um, let us as Americans travel across the country uh, to um, that almost passed in the Senate. And so I think that sends a, a strong message to all of us as Americans uh, that uh, the Senate does understand and respect the importance of the Second Amendment, but also is interested in uh, uh, letting those folks who have, uh, who are abide, abiding by the law, to um, to also carry uh, throughout the country. Um, so, the bill that I, I've authored uh, understands that instead of pursuing ineffective gun controls, we really do need to strengthen. Um, uh, the protections for law-abiding citizens who exercise their right to self-defense every day. Uh, one other comment is that uh, um, my bill would simply just make sure that law-abiding gun owners who legally carry a concealed weapon in their home state um, may do so in other states. And in, in Il Illinois does not have a permit, so they would not be allowed to carry there, but many, uh, just about every other state does. So I think that you know Americans uh, have seen over the past couple of of um, weeks that both sides of the aisle see that gun, sweeping gun control legislation um, is misguided and it is attack on law-abiding gun owners and it is designed to advance um, a, another agenda instead of really saving lives. And I believe that what we really should be focused on is uh, the people behind the weapon, the people that uh, plant the bomb, the people that are um, taking these particular tools in hurting other people, um, whether it's uh, with a, a, a ball bat or whether a crowbar or any other sort of device that people could pick up with their hands and hurt others, we really need to focus on uh, the, the mental challenges that these people have. There has to be, there, there is information that we know about these particular people and I believe that that's who we need to focus on and also us as Americans uh, need to make sure that we teach our children uh, safety. And, and if you don't, uh, you know, if, if someone has decided to, to purchase a gun, they have a responsibility to uh, understand how that particular weapon uh, operates and the, the safety measures that go along with it, uh, just like I learned in my hunter safety course when I was 12 years old and also by my father, who uh, th uh, threatened me many times that if any more windows were shot out that I was going to be paying for them. <laughs> and, um, and so that's, it's, it's uh, the, there are so many different um, ex uh, exciting and, and joyful opportunities that families can, um, can, can do together as a family with uh, firearms, but also there is a great responsibility that comes along with that. And also, uh, as uh, the quotes from our founding fathers uh, that I read before show, that there is an uh, even greater um, uh, right behind that and a, a principle behind that that uh, we do have a responsibility not only to protect ourselves but to protect other uh, citizens that we live with. So thank you for bringing this issue to the floor and uh, thank you to, um, to all of those who uh, have uh, spoken as well because I believe that as we continue this discussion that it be thoughtful, that it be careful and that uh, we uh, in, in Congress have a responsibility to, uh, to let people know that we do understand 
uh, that this issue is an important matter, but uh, as we've seen the votes from the Senate that uh, people want to know gun safety is the most important issue that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I yield Absolutely. Yeah. Very well said. I appreciate your, your comments and I'm so glad you brought uh, Peyton and Preston along. Uh, I was sharing earlier that I got my start on the farm with my BB gun as well. So uh, glad to hear you're well on your way there of having a lot of years of uh, fun hunting and doing it safely with the thanks of your father. Uh, teaching you there and you know uh, my friend from Indiana brought up some so many great points uh, the quotes from the founding fathers really bring home what this is all about and why it is very very important as a country that we retain the right as citizens to be able to protect ourselves not just from individuals but from the government uh, even and uh, well said there and as far as the Senate vote, uh, I think you brought up an excellent point as well, is that the American people really did speak. And I think overwhelmingly the American people understand um, that taking away guns or putting new restrictions on law-abiding citizens is not going to address the problems of violence in our society and would have not have prevented uh, the tragedy that occurred in Connecticut or any of the other um, shootings that we have experienced. So we need to, as I said earlier, focus on the facts and not on emotions. And I wanted to just share with you um, some of the comments uh, from people in my district. Because, you know, I think uh, lots of times people in the country have the, uh, the pulse of really what is common sense and what is wise policy for our country, uh, more so than in the heat of the moment, sometimes some things that's gone on here at the Capitol. And this is an example from Samantha of what happened in our district recently in Randolph County. And I think she has a very... Um, a very interesting perspective on this. She said, I'm a citizen of Randolph County and on Easter Sunday, two men went on a crime spree in our area and shot two very close friends of mine, pistol whipped an elder lady and killed a woman from Oberly. These suspects were on the run from police for over 12 hours, including overnight. The residents of this area didn't sleep well, not knowing what was going on. Houses were on lockdown. It was a horrible feeling knowing the armed men were able to get away from police officers for several hours and not knowing where they would go next. As a mother, I was terrified for my family. Knowing that we were protected in case these perpetrators came in our neighborhood was the only thing that made that night even bearable. Please vote to keep our Second Amendment rights. It is our right to protect ourselves from these criminals who will always be able to get guns no matter what they do, such as drugs, because drugs are illegal as well. If they want them, they will get them. Let normal, law-abiding citizens keep their guns to protect themselves. We should not be getting them taken away because there are people who are irresponsible for them. Those people will get guns no matter what, but law-abiding citizens need to be able to protect our families. It is our right, just as freedom of speech is, and should not be taken away. Well said, Samantha. I think there's a perfect example of um, what happens potentially in, when a crime is occurring uh, and how important it is for families to be able to defend themselves in that event. Here's a, a comment from Carol from Lowry City. And she said uh, in an email to me, she said, by te definition, criminals do not care about laws. They will acquire guns and whatever weapon they want to use for their nefarious activity, regardless of what the law is. The only thing this unconstitutional gun grab will do is put innocent, law-abiding citizens in harm's way by preventing them from protecting themselves, their property, and their family. If stringent gun control, which strips Second Amendment rights from the people, were the answer to alleviating violence, listen to this, then the city of Chicago will be a model of safety. Instead, Chicago, which has some of the most strict gun control laws in the nation, led the country in number of deaths relating to firearms at 532. The people could not protect themselves against the criminal activity around them, and many paid for it with their lives. Um, I wanted to share that um, some statistics from the World Health Organization. Uh, it lists... In, and you probably can't see it, but two pages worth of countries here that have a higher uh, percentage of murders per 100,000 citizens uh, than we do. 
you have countries everywhere from the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Panama, Brazil, uh, Greenland, Costa Rica, Russia, British Virgin Islands, Philippines, Uruguay, Thailand, and on and on. Two pages of countries that have very high murder rates. And yet, here's the United States below all of them. And you know what all these other countries have in common? All of their countries have banned guns 100% from their citizens. So this validates what Carol from Lowry City said to me in her email, that when you take guns away from individuals, crime rates actually go up because the criminals will have the guns and the law-abiding citizens won't be able to protect themselves. So I thought that was um, a really good, good uh, point there that she made. Uh, here's a uh, comment, an email from Vicki Joe from Clinton, Missouri. She said, I would like you to know that I do not support more regulations on any guns, accessories, or ammunition. These items are only tools some people choose to use as weapons against others. I feel the Second Amendment gives me the freedom to own and operate any firearm that I choose. I am a hunter and, if needed, would use my firearms for protection from harm. I feel that more attention needs to be spent on those that are dealing with mental illness and pose a threat to others' welfare. We law-abiding citizens don't need more laws to take more freedoms away from us. Please pursue the violators of these crimes and not their ill-chosen tools. Well said. Larry from Mexico, uh, Missouri, said, Guns can do no harm by themselves. They are no more harmful than any large vehicle like a truck or bus that has mass or weight as a part of their structure. And it's interesting that Larry would say that because yesterday I saw a clip on the news of someone who actually went after someone else in a car. The other person was on a bicycle and they tried to uh, kill them and uh, they were able to you know, save the person. Thankfully he wasn't hurt, uh, but they're still looking for the person in the car. So. Are we going to ban cars because they could be used to kill people? Of course not, because what we need to do is to find the person who was trying to commit the crime. Uh, to go on, Larry says, sick individuals can take any truck and drive it into a school or mall, killing our loved ones just as a gun can. I do not want anyone to be hurt or die, but feel that this path of legislation is wrong. As others have suggested, we need to focus on people. People are the motor driving the gun, truck, bus, or any other object. The focus has to become helping the mentally ill. And we have uh, Jessica from Warrensburg. She said, if a fraction uh, of the time, energy, money, and passion that went into debating gun control went towards establishing a more efficient national or state mental health outreach campaign, perhaps we would have less heartbreaking tragedies involving individuals who felt unheard, isolated, and alienated. And she says a commonly heard phrase is, guns don't kill people, people kill people. She goes, if that is true, what are we doing to help people? And I think that brings up the point of uh, mental health issues in our country and how we should be focusing more on these uh, killers and what caused them or led them to do it. What about violent video games? Um, if, if you look at the Newtown, Connecticut shooter, as well as the Aurora, Colorado uh, shooter, Madam Speaker, you'll find that both of them spent an inordinate amount of time playing violent video games where they actually were carrying out scenarios of shooting people. How come we are, aren't hearing proposals talking about that from gun control advocates or from those who say they want to do this to help children? Let's get to the heart of the issue here. We have Kelly from Sedalia who adds, the one thing all of these misguided proposals have in common is that they won't reduce crime. Criminals, by definition, are lawbreakers. They are not deterred by laws against murder, rape, armed robbery, etc., and they won't be affected by additional gun control laws on top of the tens of thousands of existing laws we have on the books at every governmental level. Again, I urge you to oppose any and all anti-gun legislation that will simply penalize law-abiding gun owners and instead focus on improvements to our nation's mental health system and enhancing school security while respecting our Second Amendment rights. Um, is, my, is he leaving or? All right. I was wondering, gentlemen, if you would like to come back. Um, the gentleman from Indiana brought up some really good points a while ago. 
And we share a lot in common. I think we both come from a farm background and we both still have a farm today. Uh, we both have uh, children still in school and we enjoy sharing our heritage. I know uh, a gentleman that uh, my daughter, we've had a lot of fun with her, uh, teaching her how to shoot a gun and going out also in our pasture. We've got an area that we've blocked off and we get shoot and, uh, and it's a lot of fun and she enjoys that. But I think more, just as much importantly, as um, how it's enjoyable. I, I think the, just being familiar with guns and for the potential of having self-protection is so important as well, and I know you would agree. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, as, as Peyton, our oldest, he's uh, we've given a, a bow and arrow, and, and uh, he has his straw bales out in the back of the barn. And I think that, you know, any time he goes out, we always talk to him about, look what's beyond your your target and make sure that you're not shooting in a direction towards a house or towards any other one that's behind there and it's it really does come down to to awareness and responsibility and making sure that uh, anytime you're shooting whether it's a bow and arrow or whether it's uh, a, a baseball for that matter uh, throwing a baseball or or shooting a firearm that there is an awareness always around you and um, and I know some you know we see a lot of the the tragedies that happen in cities, uh, whether it could be from um, a stray bullet, or, and that's where we need to continue to focus on those people, uh, whether it's through our churches, whether it's through charitable organizations, through schools, education, and, um, and helping people understand the, the, res the great responsibility that comes with, uh, with firearms. And so I feel fortunate to be uh, you know, raised on, uh, on a farm where I could uh, uh, Started at a very young age and was, you know, was taught the lessons of, of responsibility with uh, gun ownership, and then we're teaching the same with Peyton and Preston, and um, and there is uh, that uh, that that point of um, of, of uh, fun and the the enjoyment of of having uh, firearms as you're out uh, in the woods or wherever you're at, but uh, it also goes deeper than that. And I think that's why the Second Amendment goes to the very heart of Americans uh, and how uh, we were founded. Uh, obviously, the, the um, men who fought in the Revolutionary War and uh, you know, needed to have the, the access to, to a gun to defend themselves and to, um, uh, against the, uh, the Redcoats at the time. And, and so when uh, they, they obviously had to learn the same thing. And it wasn't just from... Uh, just to defend themselves uh, from um, uh, another army, it was also a tool used to provide food for themselves. And so we're very fortunate in so many ways that we don't have the, uh, the, the responsibilities in, in using a gun on a daily basis like uh, people used to. And so with that, uh, people don't use a firearm as often, and they do have a responsibility to make sure that they're trained uh, when they do purchase one and uh, recognizing uh, those that are around them when they're using them. But again, it goes to the heart of us as, as Americans and defending our freedom. And if it has to uh, absolutely come to that to, to defeat tyranny, that is what uh, Thomas Jefferson mentioned uh, mm -hmm. about the Second Amendment. Well, it's certainly a, a deterrent, I think, from any government who would want to uh, take on their citizens. And you look at this list that I was sharing, uh, two pages of people in countries who have a very high murder rate and um, I feel for the people of those countries, I can't imagine what that would be like to live in a country where you're basically helpless. You and your family are helpless. You are, are, are totally uh, open to and vulnerable to anyone, whether it's somebody in a government or a rogue government or a criminal who wants to do yourself or your, or your family harm and you don't have that ability to protect yourself. So I would uh, like now to hear from my a good friend from uh, Florida, Mr. Ted Yoho, and uh, I appreciate your support of the Second Amendment and I'd uh, love to hear what you have to share. I thank you for uh, the time from the gentlewoman from Missouri. Mr. Speaker, or ma Madam Speaker, I've I'm sorry, the gentleman's time has expired. Okay. Oh, so sorry. Okay. We'll, well, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, for 30 minutes. Thank you very much. I ask for unanimous consent to address the House for 30 minutes. Thank you. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you very much. Uh,
Madam Speaker, I, I do rise today to speak on our nation's need for comprehensive immigration reform. I did want to, however, uh, congratulate uh, my friend uh, Marlon Stutzman and his family. Uh, what a beautiful family. Um, and it was a, it was a delight uh, looking, at, uh, looking over and, and seeing both boys. What a, what a terrific family. I do uh, come today, though, to, to thank, really, the, the faith community in this country that has come together around comprehensive immigration reform. It, it's been interesting to see uh, how literally every denomination, every faith group <clears throat> has come together and said that we must have comprehensive immigration reform because of the values that, that they have as religious people and religious groups, but also more importantly, the religious values that we share as Americans. So I want to thank all of the groups that have been praying for us, that have come to the Capitol to speak to us, to say, open up your hearts, open up your minds, and take a look at the stranger among you. And I would like to read a letter that I received yesterday that I think puts it into in context, it's certainly in the Judeo-Christian context, and that was a letter that I received from Rabbi Ron Stern from the Stephen S. Wise Temple in Los Angeles, California. He wrote this. He addressed it to me and said, uh, Congressman Juan Vargas, among the fundamental stories of the Jewish people is the classic telling of the experience of slavery in Egypt. The story is not only told each year during the Passover Seder held by Jews around the world, but it is also referenced repeatedly as the rationale for many Jewish ethical principles. The tradition teaches us that we must always remember that we were strangers in a strange land, that we were powerless immigrants with no choice but to rely upon the grace and mercy of others who not only had power over our substance, but sometimes over our lives. The truth of the Exodus story for the Jewish people is eternal because we have often been wanderers in lands that were not our own. <clears throat> Rabbi Stern goes on and says, subsequent to the Exodus story, the first encounter with the landless powerless occurred nearly 25 years ago in the land of Babylonia. It was there that we also learned the strength that comes when a people exits the shadows and is able to take its place in the light of a nation's destiny. A vibrant Jewish community thrived there for thousands of years as citizens of a Persian nation. Elsewhere in the world, over the centuries, Jews encountered wandering, rootlessness, and powerlessness in Europe, Russia, and Northern Africa. <clears throat> With each move, we endured the insecurity of foreigners, never fully, fully welcomed in a land that benefited from our labor and our skills. He goes on and says, the all too infrequent eras of stability, security, and peace were welcomed aisles of harmony that allowed our people to prosper. Because of our history, because of our collective memory of wandering and existing as immigrants in lands that were not our own from birth, because we were wanderers who traveled to nations looking for better fortunes and left nations where fortune and safety eluded us, the Jewish people have a mission to extend compassion and embrace to others who seek the very security that we often sought for ourselves. Now that we have found peace, comfort, stability, and strength in this great country, we demand nothing less than that for others who seek these essential components of life for themselves and for their families. He then concludes like this. He says, 11 million immigrants have cared for our children, attended our schools, worked in our factories, fought our wars, frequented our businesses, and made our way of life possible. The time is now for those who have become a part of our American fabric through the sweat of their hands to be given the place in our society that we cherish for, us, for ourselves as well citizens of the United States of America. Sincerely, Rabbi Ron Stern. <clears throat> I want to thank Rabbi Stern. I think that he, along with so many others, have really, have really set the, the stage for something that I think that, that is, is not o only overdue, but that what we're going to do. And that is, 
We're going to look into our hearts and we're going to see that the stranger among us is not so strange. It was interesting that the rabbi mentioned fought our wars. For those of us that have been working with immigrants, I think probably the saddest things that we, the saddest uh, occurrences that we've encountered are these. When military men and women have spouses who are undocumented. A good example, and I gave this story before and I'll give it again, it was so compelling. Here in the Capitol, that was on the Senate side, we heard testimony. We heard testimony from a army soldier who had unfortunately been injured. He came home and his wife is taking care of him and his young family. And what he's had to do is he's had to line the car on the windows and all over the car with stickers that say, injured soldier, go army, and all sorts of other stickers that show that he is someone that went and fought for us overseas. And the reason he does this, he says, is because he doesn't want to get pulled over for some small traffic violation because his wife is the only one that's able to drive and she could be deported because she's undocumented. And probably even more compelling, we had afterwards a member of the Marines come forward and say, tragically, that he is fearful when he is sent overseas, but not of dying, interestingly. He said that he served two tours, two tours of duty in Iraq. And he said that he was scared the whole time he was there, but not, but not of what I thought. He goes, you wouldn't guess. And he says, I'm going back now to Afghanistan, and I have the same fear. And you know what his fear is? His fear is not of dying. Interestingly and, and starkly, he said, that's what Marines do. We fight and we die. I'm not afraid of that. He goes, I'm afraid that my wife will get deported because she's undocumented. I'm afraid that my wife will get deported. That's what his fear is, that his wife may be deported. And he says, what then will happen to not only my wife but my children? I'm off in Afghanistan doing what I think is right, defending our country, defending our liberty, and at the same time my wife could get deported to a nation she doesn't really even know anymore. She came as a child. She came from Mexico. How is that fair? And I can tell him that's not fair. Of course that's not fair. But I think that more and more of us are hearing these stories, and I thank him for his bravery to come forward because it does, in fact, put his, his family in peril because she could get deported. But I thank him and I thank the other brave members of the military that have come forward and given us their stories, and I've heard from many now. Now I'd like to take a moment to share with you a letter written by the Evangelical Immigration Table to us here in the United States Congress. They wrote, Dear Mr. Speaker, Boehner, and Leader Pelosi, congratulations to you and your campaign teams on your election victories. Our nation faces many great challenges and opportunities. We pray that God will lead and guide your steps and provide you with the wisdom during the years ahead. As evangelical leaders, we live every day with the reality that our immigration system does not reflect our commitment to the values of human dignity family unity, and respect for the rule of law that define us as Americans. Initiatives by both parties to advance common sense fixes to our immigration policies have stalled in the years past. Again, referring to both of our leaders, with your leadership, this can change. In the next Congress, Republicans and Democrats need to come together to pass and implement a national immigration strategy that addresses our nation's broken immigration system. We commit to supporting you. We are already working across the country to educate and mobilize our fellow evangelical Christians to support just immigration laws. Support for reform is growing in our churches, denominations, campuses, and communities. And aside, it is, and we see it here at the Capitol. We see 
more and more church groups, pastors coming and speaking to us and speaking to us in a very united way, in a very compassionate way, in a very values-filled way, saying that we have to do something. And I thank them again for that. They go on. We stand ready to support legislation that reflects our Christian values, that builds the common good. We are driven by moral obligation, rooted deeply in our faith to address the needs of immigrants in our country. Compassionate and just treatment of immigrants is a frequent topic in the scripture. The Hebrew word for immigrant, ger, occurs 92 times throughout the Bible. We respectfully request that you meet personally with leadership from the Evangelical Immigration Table in the first 92 days of the next Congress to discuss bipartisan immigration reform legislation that, one, guarantees secure national borders, two, respects the God-given dignity of every person, three, ensures fairness to taxpayers, four, protects the unity of the immediate family, five, establishes a path toward legal status and or citizenship for those who qualify and those who wish to become permanent residents. And number six, respects the rule of law. They go on and say, these principles are endorsed by the signers of this letter and by more than 150 other prominent evangelical leaders from around the nation. The principles reflect a growing convergence with the position of other religious, civic, business, labor, and law enforcement leaders. We urge you to reach across the aisle and to work to create a bipartisan solution that reflects our values, creates just and humane immigration laws, and moves us forward together. The letter was signed by Leith Anderson, President of the National Association of Evangelicals, Stephen Bauman, President and CEO of World Relief, David Beckman, President, Bread for the World, Noel Castellanos, CEO, Christian Community Development Association, Robert Gittleson, President, Conservatives for Comprehensive Immigration Reform, Richard Land, President, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commissions of the Southern Baptist Convention, Samuel Rodriguez, President, National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, Gabriel Salguero, President, National Latino Evangelical Coalition, Richard Stearns, President, World Vision United States, and Jim Wallace, President and CEO of Sojourners. So why have all of these evangelical leaders, and why have so many other faith groups come together and, say, and said with a unified voice that we have to have comprehensive immigration reform? Well, as they say, the reason is because of their values, because they believe in the Bible, and they believe that the stranger among us must be treated as ourselves. In fact, interestingly, some of them quote Leviticus, and in Leviticus, of course, it says that you shall love the alien, the stranger, as you love yourselves, because you have to remember that you once were strangers, too, in the land of Egypt. And so I thank all of these religious leaders, all of these faith communities that have come together. And interestingly, I, I can't recall another time when you've had so many so many different religious faiths, groups, pastors, reverends, rabbis, come together with one voice and say, this is the path forward. We all agree. But we have it here. And the nice thing about it is that I think we are getting to a point where we are going to agree that we have to have a comprehensive immigration package that reflects the values that they've spoken to, the values that we hold dear as Americans, and I think that we are going to get there. And I thank each and every one of them that prays for us, because I am a person of faith. I do believe that prayers work, and I can feel their fervent prayers here. We can all feel them here. And it's a wonderful thing. I do want to read a few more letters and a few more quotes from, from these same evangelical leaders because I think it's important, again, to get a feel for how unanimous they are. 
that we have to have comprehensive immigration reform that really reflects our best values, our better angels. So here's a press release from the evangelical leaders to amplify the call for bipartisan immigration reform with radio ads, and they're doing these in key states. It says, Dr. Richard Land, President, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, Southern Baptist Convention. A quote, evangelical Christians who listen to Christian radio tend to be well-educated in the scriptures and politically engaged. Reaching them with this message about God's heart for immigrants and the importance of immigration solutions rooted in biblical values will be absolutely critical for building the political will we need to pass meaningful reforms in 2013. Our political leaders need to hear from our constituents and from their constituents and know that evangelical Christians are strongly behind them if they have the moral courage to act on the values we see in Matthew 25 and other places in the scripture concerning welcoming the stranger. End of quote. I thank Dr. Richard Landon when he says that he hopes that we hear from our constituents, we are hearing from them. And in fact, we're also hearing from Dr. Richard Land and other leaders in the evangelical churches that have come here to say, you know, if you have any distrust in your heart for the immigrant, the stranger, or even hate, put it aside. Put it aside. Instead, follow your heart and understand that the immigrant, the stranger among you, deserves your love, your attention, your values. And I think it's happening here. And again, I don't think it's by accident. I think it's by their prayers. I think it's by them coming together with a united voice and saying, we have to do what is right. And I thank them. I'd like to read now from Reverend Dr. Uth, senior pastor of the First Baptist Orlando. And the reason I want to read the pastor's notes is because the pastor not only talks about general form, he comes from a particular area, Orlando. And this is his quote. There is a consistent message throughout Scripture, and it's a command to welcome and to treat fairly all people, but especially the stranger and the foreigner in your land. When we fail to welcome the stranger, in essence, we fail to welcome Christ. And so Christians in our church, when they learn about God's heart for, immig for the immigrant and what the Bible has to say, their hearts are open because we are a people of faith. And it is our desire to live our faith in our world. Coupled with that, when they meet these immigrants, when they have personal encounters, all of the sudden, this issue has a face. It has a story. And it is in that meeting that transformation happens and has happened here for us. And we know that the time is now for this discussion. And I thank the pastor. And I thank him because he's right. But I also thank him because I think his prayers, his supplications are being answered. I think the prayers of his congregation are being answered. We are coming together, and we are coming together in a bipartisan way. There are many other things that we disagree on, and I've been here not very long, but I can already tell you there's a lot of things that we disagree on. But more and more, we're coming together around the issue of comprehensive immigration reform. And we're coming together because it's the right thing to do. In fact, the voices now, and they're few and they're shrill, seem to be a real outlier now. They seem to be far out. Nowhere in the mainstream. Instead, we're down to the nitty gritty and we're, we're trying to figure out the small things. And I think that that's very good. I think that that's healthy. And I appreciate, again, the, the candor that we've had on this discussion. Madam Leader, it's great to see you here. It's always a pleasure. And it is a pleasure also to have the discussion on immigration. Be so humane, values-based. But also, some of the interests interest around the, the country are coming together, too. 
I sit on the Agricultural Committee and we were having a committee hearing on horticulture and specialty crops. And almost immediately the discussion went to comprehensive immigration reform because it's one of the most important things for the agricultural community. And interestingly, they said that the, the bill in the Senate's not perfect. The bill that, that we're going to produce here is not perfect, but it's getting close. And they're saying that there's a lot of agreement between those that work in the field and represent them and those that are the farmers. It's wonder, when do you see that? It seldom happens. Again, I think it's happening because of the prayers of the pastors. And I do want to read a few more of them because they've, they've sent so many of them now to my office and and also because I, I do appreciate what they're doing. They're making a difference here. This is, and I also want to show that it's not only in Orlando and one part of the country, it's all over the country. That pastors, that uh, religious groups are coming together to pray for us, to encourage us to move forward on comprehensive immigration reform. So I'd like to read from Reverend Dr. Fleming, senior pastor, Champion Forest Baptist Church in Houston, Texas. <clears throat> this is a quote. We begin now to see immigrants as us. We live together. We work together. We serve together. We are all in this together. And the notion of welcoming the outsider and the stranger and inviting them in has been key to that. We see the immigrant as a person created in the image of God. Their husbands and wives, their parents, their children. Oftentimes our broken immigration system causes great suffering in the homes and in the families and in the people's lives. I believe that my experience has been here in Texas that conservative Christians and evangelicals are rising to support a biblical approach to this very complex issue. And I thank him and I thank Dr. Reverend David Fleming, senior pastor, Champion Forest Baptist Church in Houston for his courage, for his prayers, for his encouragement, for his heart, and for his insight. I think it's very insightful. We're beginning, I, get a quote, I want to quote him, we're beginning now to see immigrants as us. We live together. We work together. We serve together. We're all in this together. And the notion of welcoming the outsider and the stranger and inviting them in has been key to that. And in fact, they have been invited in. I've had the great honor now to speak to many pastors and evangelization has happened with many of the undocumented people that have come to our nation. And now, in fact, as the, earlier the Marine that I, I spoke of, as well as the, the soldier, oftentimes they meet their spouses in church they get married. And then we put them in the situation that if, if they legally want to live together, their spouse has to leave the country for 10 years. Can you imagine that? The Marine, who is again going to be deployed overseas, for his wife to be here legally, she would have to leave the country for 10 years? Would she, what would she do with the children? Does she take them with her? They're American citizens. Does she go to this country that she, she really doesn't know anymore? How can that be right? How can that be fair? How can that be just? How can that be Christian? How can those be our values? They're not our values. And that's why I thank Dr. Pastor David Fleming for stepping forward and saying it's time that we change. Now, I happen to be a Catholic. So I'd like to quote now Archbishop Jose Gomez, the Archbishop of Los Angeles and Chairman of the USCCB Committee on Migration. I'd like to quote him and he says this, Our collective faith groups are prepared to support just and humane reform of a broken immigration system. With the President's leadership and cooperation between both parties and Congress, we can achieve this goal within the year. We agree with the President and the bipartisan Senate leaders who are stressing the importance of a path to citizenship for the undocumented. We should not sanction a permanent underclass in our society. Never to correct a, an archbishop. However, I would add that also the work, the good work that's being done bipartisanly here too in this house, in the Congress, and you will soon see a bill. 
And I thank and I pray every day for the members of that group that are working hard, often under great stress, to come forward with a bill, a change in the law that represents our better angels, that represents our values as Americans, as Christians, as Jews, as people of faith. So I thank them. I'd also like to quote Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. Quote, today's meeting invigorated me with hope and faith and optimism. The president's resolve in conjunction, in conjunction excuse me, with evangelical support facilitate the prescription for a comprehensive resolution addressing Americans' immigration crisis. I am convinced that with prayer and prophetic activism, we will live out Matthew 25 and welcome the stranger in the name of Jesus. Of course, he, he, famously, he quotes famously Matthew 25. Matthew 25, of course, is the judgment where Jesus himself says how we will be judged as a nation. I hope you go back and read that part of Scripture. And he says, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was ill, you cured me. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was a prisoner, you visited me. And then, of course, they'll ask, the sheep will ask, well, when do we do that, Jesus? When you did it to the least of my brothers. That's what Reverend Samuel Rodriguez was quoting, and most Christian groups quote. It's, it's so profoundly profoundly who we are, the welcoming of the stranger, Christ among us. So, Madam Speaker, I know I don't have much time left, and I, I appreciate deeply the, the time that I was given today to speak to my colleagues and to speak to a, hopefully a louder crowd, a, maybe a louder crowd, but a larger crowd, that I have great faith. I have great faith that we are coming together, and we're coming together in a way that we will produce a bill that we can all be proud of and hopefully that we will all support but that we'll have bipartisan support and it won't be an accident it'll be because of the prayers of these pastors it'll be because of the courage of Rabbi Stern it'll be because of all the encouragement that we've received from the faith communities outside of this house it is because of, of their fervent love and support for the immigrant that the stranger that we will have a just law. And I thank them. And Madam Speaker, thank you for the opportunity today. And I, again, thank you. The gentleman yields back. Yield my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back.